Hi there, good afternoon. I'm Chris Fanta. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Asthma Grand Rounds 2019. Happy New Year. And I welcome those joining us by live webcasting. I, I did want to mention that today, for the first time in a long time, we are offering CME credit to those who would like it uh, for attending either live or via the webcasting. Uh, if you here in the audience, just sign up on the sign-up sheet in the hallway uh, entrance to the amphitheater. Those of you who would like a CME credit or watching by webcasting, please, I need your name, degree, like MD, NP, DO, et cetera, uh, and email address, and you can send it to the uh, email address, cfantatpartners.org. We also welcome questions. You can do them verbally for those watching by live webcasting, uh, just text it your question uh, this morning to the number shown here. Jot it down and maybe we can show this again at the end of the presentation. So uh, it's a, a great honor that we uh, start the new year with an asthma superstar. We're delighted to have Dr. Joshua Boyce uh, as our speaker. Most of you already know that he is the head of the section on inflammation and allergic disease in our uh, division of rheumatology, immunology, and allergy here at uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital. He heads the uh, Jeff and Penny Vinick Center for Allergic Disease Research, and he is the Albert L. Sheffer Professor of Medicine in the field of allergic, de uh, allergic disease research at Harvard Medical School. So we're delighted to have him here today to uh, discuss his work unraveling the mechanisms of aspirin-exacerbated respiratory disease. Dr. Boyce. Thanks, Chris. Um, Chris and I were just reminiscing. I, I realized as I was putting this together that, um, that I've been here as long as it's been Partners Asthma Center and uh, Chris, over the years, has been tremendously supportive of me and my group, and I'm very grateful for that. And Chris is the one who taught me, as a newly minted pediatric pulmonologist, not to be afraid of adult asthmatics with FEV1s of 35% of predicted that reversed all the way to 40% of predicted when you gave him prednisone. Uh, so, Chris, thank you for the role that you've played uh, in my development, and also thank you for really being the, uh, the heart and the brains behind Partners Asthma Center over these years. Um, so, uh, today I'm going to talk about a topic that I've been interested in, I realize now, for over 20 years and really for the last decade have devoted a lot of time and resources to trying to understand, uh, and that is the mechanism underlying aspirin-exacerbated respiratory disease, which is really a fascinating uh, disease and a clinically very important disease because it's a major source of morbidity and it's not at all uh, uncommon. And uh, so today is going to be uh, partly a little bit of a personal reflection, uh, uh, partly a review of the literature, and also uh, some newer data. And I'll say that none of the data I present today would have been possible without a concerted team effort. I have the tremendous privilege of being surrounded by people who are uh, just as devoted and passionate about this uh, pursuit as, as I am. Um, so uh, my disclosures, uh, fortunately, have no bearing on the content of today's presentation. So aspirin-exacerbated respiratory disease, or AERD, is sort of the awkward designation now given to something we used to call aspirin intolerant asthma, or SAMHSA's triad. And the triad is asthma, chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyposis, and both of these tend to be on the severe end of the spectrum for those disorders. And then the one pathognomonic feature of the disease is the reaction that occurs reproducibly on the ingestion of aspirin or, in fact, any drug that inhibits COX-1. So it's not simply aspirin-induced. They are COX-1 inhibitor-induced reactions. And the fact that COX-1 inhibitors comprise a broad spectrum of structurally distinct drugs, and yet every single patient will react the same way to every single one of these drugs, tells you this isn't a drug allergy. This is a pharmacologic idiosyncrasy reflective of a unique dependency on COX-1 to maintain a tenuous homeostasis over an unstable respiratory system. <clears throat> 
Now, the respiratory disease itself, which is there regardless of whether you've ever taken aspirin or not, is characterized by severe eosinophilic inflammation and infiltration with activated mast cells, which is what you see here with this uh, tryptase immunostain and this H&E stain from a nasal polyp that was surgically excised from one of Tanya Laidlaw's patients. And this severe type 2 immunopathology is generally not accompanied by much evidence, if any evidence, of A to B. Most of these patients lack positive skin tests. They're, more, they're no more likely than the general population to be allergic to common environmental allergens. So it's clearly not driven by an environmental allergen as we understand it. And there's probably a role for local antibody production and adaptive immunity. But really, we don't know what drives this process. We do know that there's a substantial amount of data to support a dysregulated innate immune response in this disease. And today I'm going to talk about three features of a dysregulated innate immune response, one being persistent overproduction of cystinal leukotrienes, a second being a dysregulated mast cell system, and a third being dysregulated platelet activation. And what I'm going to try to do is convince you all that these three features are in fact mechanistically linked and by understanding the nature of that mechanistic link, we can come to a central uh, thesis about what causes the disease and what we can do about it. So I'm going to uh, spend a couple of moments here reviewing the biology of the cystinyl leukotrienes, which Dr. Austin could do in his sleep, since he essentially defined this pathway. And hopefully you all know that cystinyl leukotrienes are metabolites of arachidonic acid generated primarily, if not exclusively, by myeloid effector cells. And myeloid cells hold in common the ability to oxidize arachidonic acid uh, by the actions of 5-lipoxygenase to create an unstable precursor known as leukotriene A4. Now, in most myeloid cells, leukotriene A4 gets conjugated to reduce glutathione to form leukotriene C4, which is the first cystinyl leukotriene. And that reaction is catalyzed by the enzyme leukotriene C4 synthase. I say in most myeloid cells because neutrophils don't have LTC4 synthase. So they can't take LTA4 all the way to the end of this reaction. What they do instead is they hydrolyze LTA4 to make LTB4. But Neutrophils can actually form a conjugate with platelets in inflammatory responses. And platelets have LTC4 synthase. And although platelets don't have 5-LO and can't create their own LTA4, a platelet, once it adheres to a neutrophil, or indeed to any myeloid cell, becomes competent to utilize LTA4 from that myeloid cell and generate LTC4. And the reason I'm harping on this is it turns out that's probably an important piece of the AERD uh, story, and we'll come back to that later on. So LTC4 is essentially a precursor, although it is a mediator unto itself. It is very quickly converted extracellularly to leukotriene D4, which is the most potent airway smooth muscle spasmogen known to exist, over a thousandfold more powerful than histamine. Leukotriene D4 is exceedingly short-lived because of the removal of glycine by three different dipeptidase enzymes that convert it to LTE4. Now, LTE4 is a stable metabolite. You can readily measure it in urine. And in fact, in clinical studies, it is fairly common to measure urinary LTE4 as a time-weighted reflection of leukotriene production in vivo. And we'll see some examples of that. So in essence, uh, a single synthetic event inside the cell gives rise to three different mediators, which have differing half-lives and stabilities. All three of those mediators are bioactive. And once their chemical structures were derived and the synthetic leukotrienes became available, a number of groups, including Frank Austin's group and Jeff Drazen's group here at the Brigham, began to do studies in human subjects and found that indeed cystinal leukotrienes are exceedingly potent smooth muscle spasmogens, but also inducers of vascular leak in the skin and in the lung, inducers of mucus secretion, and importantly, inducers of eosinophilic inflammation all of which are potentially very relevant to a potential role for these molecules in asthma. And these observations were made using classical physiology, 
and pharmacology. There was no molecular biology yet. And nobody knew exactly how they worked, but there were predictions made that there were probably three receptors for cystinoleukotrienes, and that prediction turned out to be absolutely correct. The first two receptors were cloned and characterized by Jilly Evans's group at Merck Pharmaceuticals, cislt one and cislt 2 which differ in their ligand binding preferences and also differ in where they tend to be expressed, cislt one being principally on smooth muscle in terms of structural cells and cislt 2 on endothelial and epithelial cells. And then uh, Yoshihida Kanaoka about six years ago uh, identified the third and probably the final cystinoleukotriene receptor, cislt 3 formerly known as GPR99, which has a preference for binding LTE4 and is expressed by mucosal epithelial cells. So we have three receptors and three ligands, a fairly complex system. I'll point out that although the three receptors tend to be expressed in geographically segregated cell populations in structural cells, cislt one and two are also co-expressed on a lot of cells, particularly hematopoietic cells, which introduces the potential for leukotrienes not only to have direct effects on structural cells, but also indirect effects uh, or direct effects on hematopoietic cells and inflammation. And platelets express both cislt one and two. And I raise that here because a platelet has LTC4 synthase as well. And so there's the potential here for a platelet to generate its own leukotriene as a ligand. And we'll come back to that later on. So what do leukotrienes uh, do in vivo in humans? Well, we have a number of reagents that help us to answer that question because the drugs that target this pathway came out pretty early in the ball game. Xyluton was FDA approved for treating asthma in 1996, and then Zephyrlucast and Montelukast followed uh, shortly thereafter in 1998 and 99. And so these drugs uh, can be used to probe what leukotrienes actually do in people. And there's no human disease where leukotrienes make a more prominent contribution than AERD. So leukotrienes are overproduced in AERD at steady state. This is data from one of Tanya's papers, but this is essentially reproducing the data from multiple groups across multiple populations and multiple continents, a very reproducible result. Urinary LTE4 is high in patients with AERD, and when you challenge them with aspirin, as the late Andre Shecklick did in this very elegant study, the urinary LTE4 spikes even further, very sharply, and then comes down back to baseline after a few hours. And this spike occurs concomitantly with the decline in lung function, which you see here in terms of the FEV1 tracing. And so this is a very classic reaction to aspirin. And it's not just a change in FEV1. They also sneeze, their nose gets stuffier, their eyes run and water. And in some instances, they get belly pain and rash. And you, so you see that this occurs concomitantly with this unbreaking of the leukotriene system. This third line here is thromboxane metabolite in the urine, which tells you, as it goes down, that COX-1 is being inhibited by aspirin, just tells you aspirin hit its target. Now, how important is the surge in the cystinal leukotrienes for inducing the classical signs and symptoms of a reaction? Well, Jeff Drazen and Elliot Israel published this nice paper in the Blue Journal, one of the first papers to actually look at the effect of xyluton in human subjects, and showed that if you pretreat patients with AERD with xyluton before you give them aspirin, you completely block the change in FEV1. And not only that, you basically block everything. For the most part, these patients tend to have much milder sinonasal symptoms. If they have belly pain, that tends to go away or be much, much less severe. A lot of the manifestations, if not all of them, are sensitive to xyluton. But interestingly, they're not entirely sensitive to cislt one antagonists. In general, cislt one antagonists tend to blunt the change in FEV1 but most of the extrapulmonary symptoms remain. And the point I'm making here is that cislt one is probably the dominant receptor for the smooth muscle effects, but the other receptors participate in the reaction physiologically as well. So there's a dysregulated leukotriene system in this disease that contributes significantly to its pathophysiology. Where are the leukotrienes coming from? 
Well, if you're an allergist, you think the mast cell does everything. And the mast cell does a lot of things, and we think of the mast cell as the pr principal effector of IgE-dependent immune responses, where if you cross-link the IgE receptor, you get mediators released, you get leukotrienes produced, and you get a number of cytokines and chemokines. But remember that this is a disease where the reaction is not caused by a drug allergy. The reaction is caused by pharmacologic inhibition of COX-1. So if mast cells are involved in producing the leukotrienes, they're probably not getting activated principally through the IgE receptor. And we have to think about other ways that mast cells can be activated. And mast cells are very important in innate immunity, and accordingly they are endowed with a number of other activation mechanisms. I highlight, I highlight IL-33 here because it's gonna become an important part of this story a little bit later on. So are mast cells involved in AERD? Showing you data here from another one of Andre Shecklick's papers. This is a paper that looked at baseline serum tryptase levels as an index of mast cell activation. Now this is steady state, there's no challenge involved here. We're just looking at tryptase, which is a protease that comes only from mast cells in the serum of patients with AERD versus aspirin tolerant asthmatics and healthy controls. And you can see that the tryptase level is on average about twofold above the background for the control groups with a lot of variation. There are some patients who have very high levels of tryptase and some patients who have normal le levels of tryptase, but on average it's higher, suggesting the mast cells are leaky. And then what happens if you give them aspirin? Well, if you give them aspirin, the tryptase levels tend to increase in these patients with AERD. And in fact, it looks a lot like what I described for the urinary leukotrienes. Right? There's a baseline leak, and then there's an unbreaking with the administration of aspirin to inhibit COX-1. So how important are mast cells? I'm going to show you data from two old studies that use the classical mast cell stabilizing drugs, chromalin. Now, I started doing asthma center stuff with Chris back in the days when we were still prescribing chromalin as an asthma controller, and then it got wiped out by inhaled glucocorticoids. But chromalin is actually a very informative drug. And this paper kind of blew my mind. This comes from a Japanese language only journal. But the figures and the legends are all in English. And what the investigators did here was to perform a chromalin inhalation, a single dose of chromalin, in a group of subjects with AERD and follow their FEV1. Now, chromalin never changed anybody's FEV1. But here, it increased FEV1 in these patients with AERD acutely by about 20% over the placebo. Big increase, like a bronchodilator. It didn't do anything to the control group, which had asthma but were aspirin tolerant. Suggesting this leaky mast cell is driving some of the airways dysfunction at baseline. And perhaps it shouldn't surprise you that when you challenge with aspirin, if you pretreat with chromalin, or its cousin drug, nidocromol, which is also off the market, you can blunt about 70% of the change in FEV1. So the mast cell is leaky, and the mast cell is important in this disease, perhaps disproportionately show, so compared with aspirin-tolerant asthma. So perhaps it stands to reason then that mast cells are firing, and they're making a lot of leukotrienes, and that's the sequence that we have to concentrate on. But it's not that simple. It never is. So this comes from another one of Jeff Drazen and Elliot Israel's old papers. This came out around the time I started at the Asthma Center. And this, again, was a study of Xyluton. And in this case, the investigators were looking at the nasal manifestations of a reaction to aspirin. And Xyluton completely blocks the nasal response in terms of the signs and symptoms. The surprise was here. They measured nasal lavage tryptase levels. Mariana will remember this because she helped them out with this. Uh, and what they found was shocking, I thought, because here's the nasal lavage tryptase. It increases in the placebo group challenged with aspirin, but it doesn't increase at all in the xyluton group. This is the reverse of what you expect. You expect that if the mast cell is making the leukotrienes, then you have to stabilize the mast cell to prevent leukotriene release. But this says it's the opposite way around. The leukotrienes have to be made 
by something in order for the mast cells to fire. So this is very different than how classical type 1 hypersensitivity works. So we have to think about where else leukotrienes might come from. And now I'm going to introduce the third dysregulated system, which is the platelet system. And this data comes from uh, Tanya Laidlaw's first real seminal paper in blood about seven years ago. Uh, and in this paper, she very astutely recognized that in sinonasal tissues from patients with AERD, there seem to be a lot of extravasated platelets. Platelets here are recognized by an immunofluorescence assay using CD61, a red stain, to recognize the platelets. The platelets here appear to be clumping. There are these complexes of platelets, and they look like they're sticking to these green staining CD45 positive white blood cells. These are platelet conjugates with white blood cells in the sinonasal tissue, and they are significantly more common in the AERD samples than in the aspirin tolerant controls, both expressed as an absolute number and as a percentage. And it turns out that when she looked in the peripheral blood of subjects with and without AERD, she could also detect very large numbers of eosinophils, neutrophils, and monocytes that had CD61 positive platelets stuck to their surface. That is what these flow cytometry tracings are telling you. So the platelets are sticky, and they're sticky adherent to the white blood cells, particularly those white blood cells that have an active 5-lipoxygenase enzyme. Now, what might that mean? Well, I mentioned earlier that platelets have LTC4 synthase. And when they stick to white cells, they can convert LTA4 to LTC4. So the next question to ask was whether platelets might be contributing to leukotriene production. And so in these studies, Tanya used a cell-free enzymatic assay that detects the amount of LTC4 synthase associated with a given cell population. And when she looked at platelets, from patients with and without AERD, there was really no difference. The platelet itself has the same amount of LTC4 synthase, whether you have the disease or not. But when she looked at the granulocytes from the blood, there was about a seven-fold difference in the amount of LTC4 synthase associated with the granulocyte fraction, more in AERD than in aspirin-tolerant asthma. And when she stripped the platelets off using a gentle trypsinization procedure that number fell by about 60%, suggesting that more than half of the LTC4 synthase associated with the granulocyte is actually not in the granulocyte, it's in the platelet. Now, is that important for driving leukotriene overproduction? That's hard to answer directly in a human study, but here we're looking at the percentages of platelet-adherent eosinophils, neutrophils, and monocytes correlated with the urinary leukotriene E4 levels at baseline, and you can see that there's a pretty good statistical relationship, suggesting that the adherent platelets are contributing substantially to the leukotriene overproduction and dysregulation associated with the disease. Okay, so a little bit of personal history here. It's 1996, I'm in my third year in Dr. Austin's lab. I'm trying to learn how to grow mast cells from cord blood, and I'm feeling a little bit in the weeds. Where's my career going? Does my work have anything to do with clinical medicine? And he's telling me to be patient, and it'll all work out. And this paper comes out in the Blue Journal, which absolutely blew my mind. Now, up until this point, the prevailing hypothesis about aspirin sensitivity was it's a shunt. If I give you aspirin, I shut off your cyclooxygenase pathway, and therefore your arachidonic acid has to go down the lipoxygenase pathway, and you make a bunch of leukotrienes. And it made no sense. Because if the shunt hypothesis were correct, then every one of you would have AERD when we give you a COX inhibitor. We just have to increase the dose. So this paper, done by an Italian group, very carefully done study, showed that if you gave a single dose of a cyclooxygenase product, prostaglandin E, to patients with AERD, you could completely block the reaction to aspirin that you see here happening in the placebo inhalation control group. But more importantly, 
it completely blocked the increase in urinary LTE4. To me, this was a profound message. It said, there's no shunt. There is active suppression of effector cell function by a prostaglandin. And I convinced myself that that's what I had to focus on for my research going forward. And we eventually got there. So what do we know about prostaglandin E? Prostaglandin E is probably the most ubiquitous of all arachidonic acid products because essentially every cell in your body can make some. And it's important for a number of housekeeping functions. Uh, now, it can come from two different enzyme systems. It can come from COX-1, which is essentially a constitutively expressed enzyme that's always turned on, at least a little bit, to provide sort of a trickle of prostaglandins that you need to maintain housekeeping functions. Or it can come from COX-2. And COX-2 is a much more robust enzyme. It gets upregulated with inflammation and it gets co-upregulated with a second enzyme known as microsomal PGE synthase 1 in macrophages and in epithelial cells and fibroblasts, which seem to be the principal producers of prostaglandin E. And therefore, when there's inflammation, you get a lot more prostaglandin E produced. It goes up in most inflammatory conditions. And I'll point out here, there's a very important difference between these two enzyme systems. This one, the COX-2 system, is pretty resistant to aspirin. You have to give 325, 650 milligrams of aspirin to begin to affect COX-2. But this one is wimpy. I give you a baby aspirin, and I'll inhibit 90% of your COX-1. So they differ in terms of their aspirin sensitivity. Keep that in mind. Now, PGE2 is pretty complicated in terms of how it works. It's also complicated in terms of whether it's pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory. It depends on the organ and the context. In the lung, it's principally anti-inflammatory. And the anti-inflammatory effects of PGE work principally through two receptors, EP2 and EP4. And those two receptors share the property of being able to stimulate adenylate cyclase and increase cyclic AMP. So if you ever took pharmacology, you know that if you increase cyclic AMP, it will relax smooth muscle. It will prevent the activation of many immune cells and prevent their proliferation as well. So it can act as sort of an immune suppressant, a short-lived immune suppressant. And it turns out that three of the cyclic AMP sensitive systems that I talked about today are the leukotriene system, because leukotriene production, 5-lipoxygenase, can be phosphorylated by cyclic AMP-dependent PKA and stabilized. Mast cells can be stabilized through the same system, and platelets can be stabilized through the same system. And so if you think about it, that means that this prostaglandin, this COX product, can suppress the activation of the three systems that I told you are messed up in AERD. And it turns out there's a fair amount of data out there indicating that there are defects in the prostaglandin E synthetic pathway in the respiratory tissues of patients with AERD, characterized by low levels of prostaglandin E from extracts of nasal polyps, reduced expression of COX-2 and microsomal PGE synthase 1, and perhaps hypermethylation of PGE synthase 1, which suppresses its induction. If you think about what that means, You've got an inflammatory disease where you're supposed to have this second pathway for COX-2 and PGE synthase to give you PGE, and it's missing. So what's that going to do? I give you an aspirin, and all of a sudden, I have shut off this tenuous source of PGE, and I am unbreaking your mast cells, your 5-lipoxygenase, and your platelets. So is that what actually happens? Very hard to answer that question in humans. And you can only just go so far doing human ex vivo experiments. Now, I am not a mouse doctor. I didn't study to be a mouse doctor. I didn't want to be a mouse doctor. And I was led kicking and screaming to do mouse work. But Tao Lu is a mouse doctor, and a very good one. And Tao came to my lab nine years ago. And we had a hypothesis at the time that if a mouse has an impairment in this inducible system to make PGE, that it might develop an AERD-like phenotype if you give them a little bit of inflammation. 
And the strain that we used was a microsomal PGE synthase knockout strain that had been made by the Akira lab in Japan some years before. The model that Tao developed was uh, a low-dose dust mite priming period followed by a 24-hour resting period to allow the airway's resistance to return to normal, and then an aspirin challenge by inhalation. So what happens? Well, notably, if you aspirin challenge the PGE synthase null mice, you get this beautiful increase in airway's resistance that doesn't happen at all in the wild-type controls. And you also get this lovely increase in leukotrienes and mast cells, which didn't show up. Okay, so one of the first questions we wanted to ask using this model was, what are platelets contributing? First of all, does this model recapitulate the sticky platelet phenotype that you see in the human? And so this is flow cytometry on mouse peripheral blood granulocytes. And here CD41 is used as a platelet-specific marker. And so in this histogram, anything that's shifted off to the right has a platelet stuck to it. And you can see that wild-type mice have a platelet-negative peak of granulocytes and a platelet-positive peak of granulocytes, roughly 50-50. But the PGE synthase knockout mice have this big shift off to the right, suggesting that most, if not all, of the granulocytes are, in fact, platelet-adherent. So you take away that enzyme, and the platelets become sticky. Now, can you find these platelet-adherent granulocytes in the lung? Well, actually, you can, and particularly so if you do an aspirin challenge. So this is histology of the lung, done by Howard Katz in our group, for CD41. CD41, again, being a platelet-specific stain. And what we're looking at here are mice that are challenged with PBS by inhalation and mice that are challenged with lysine aspirin by inhalation. And the lysine aspirin challenge, within 45 minutes, you start to see these CD41 positive staining events, which are platelets, some of which are, appear to be larger. These are probably complexes stuck to white blood cells. And if you do an anti-CD41 antibody treatment to deplete the platelets, they don't appear. So platelets get recruited in this model acutely with a lysine aspirin challenge. So what does that do physiologically? So now you can start to do experiments that you could never do in a human. So in these experiments, Tau used neutralizing antibodies to CD41, which depletes the platelets and the platelet-adherent granulocytes, GR1, which depletes neutrophils, and anti-IL-5, which depletes eosinophils, and then did his lysine aspirin challenge. And you can see, relative to the isotype control, that the antiplatelet antibody, and to a lesser extent, the anti-neutrophil antibody, markedly reduces the response to aspirin, suggesting that the platelet-adherent granulocytes are important for the physiologic response. They are also important for the cystinal leukotriene release. These come back almost to the PBS control baseline with the platelet depletion. And since I told you earlier, that in humans with AERD, if you block leukotriene production, you block mast cell activation. Well, lo and behold, the same thing is true in the mouse. When you deplete the platelets, you deplete the granulocytes, you lose the mast cell activation to a large extent. So the platelet-adherent granulocyte is doing something downstream to activate the mast cell. All right, so how's that working? Platelets have a lot of inflammatory mediators and cytokines. And they're instrumental in many inflammatory disease models, not just in hemostasis. But there's one mediator in particular that uh, caught our eye, and that is high mobility group box one. Now this is a molecule that is a DNA binding protein. And when cells become necrotic, it gets released and it serves as sort of a danger signal or alarm signal to the tissues that something is wrong. And HMGB1 is rather promiscuous in terms of the receptors that it can bind to activate cells. It can bind to either receptor for advanced glycation end products, or RAGE, which is an immunoglobulin-like receptor, or it can bind to any one of three different toll-like receptors. And through that binding, it can induce the activation of epithelial cells, endothelial cells, granulocytes, platelets, and T cells. It turns out that platelets have HMGB1 stored in their cytosol, 
and they release it with physiologic activation. They don't have to undergo necrosis to release HMGB1. And there's some very interesting studies from the surgical group at Pittsburgh on the role of platelet HMGB1 in shock lung and ischemia reperfusion injury. Now, in addition to the fact that platelets can release HMGB1, there's a growing body of literature to support the role of HMGB1 and RAGE in severe asthma and in chronic rhinosinusitis, two features of AERD. They tend, the levels in tissues tend to correlate with disease severity. And there's also beautiful mouse work suggesting that HMGB1 and RAGE are essential to induce eosinophilic pathology in mouse models of allergic pulmonary inflammation. So we had a lot of reasons to be interested in HMGB1 and what was it doing. And so Tao performed a couple of experiments. Now this is actually ELISA data from a human set of human samples. This is uh, nasal fluid samples from five subjects with AERD, four healthy controls. This is very preliminary, and one could argue about whether healthy controls are an appropriate uh, uh, control group. But you can see quite high levels of HMGB1 being leaked out into the nasal fluid in AERD. Now, in the mouse model of AERD, Tao found that a lysine aspirin challenge induced about a 60% increase acutely in BAL fluid levels of HMGB1. It was being released in response to the lysine aspirin challenge, and it's coming from platelets, because if you deplete the platelets with anti-CD41, that 60% increase essentially completely goes away. So HMGB1 is being released by the platelet. How is it being released? Why is it being released? What does it matter? To answer the how it's being released question first, I'm gonna show you a little bit of ex vivo pharmacology. Remember, I said platelets not only make leukotrienes, but they have leukotriene receptors, one and two. And so these are experiments where Tau stimulated the platelets ex vivo, these are mouse platelets, with LTC4, LTD4, or LTE4, and monitored their release of HMGB1 over time using a flow cytometry-based assay. You can do this because HMGB1 first moves to the cell surface before it gets pinched off into microparticles. And you see this beautiful induction of HMGB1 release, which only occurs with LTC4, not with LTD4 or E4, and it's paralleled by an increase in P-selectin expression. P-selectin is what platelets stick onto their surface in order to grab a white blood cell. Now, this set of experiments shows that if you feed the platelet LTA4, which is what an activated granulocyte would do, that will also induce HMGB1, but that is missing if the platelet has no LTC4 synthase. So this tells you that a platelet is capable of converting LTA4 to LTC4 sufficiently to activate itself to express HMGB1 and also P-selectin. And if you do that in a cis-LT2 knockout platelet, neither LTA4 nor LTC4 work at all. This tells you this activation event requires cis-LT2, not the receptor that we block with conventional antagonists. It's a receptor for which we yet to have an antagonist that we can use in vivo. Now, I mentioned that platelets themselves in addition to releasing HMGB1, can respond to HMGB1, and they do this either through RAGE or TLR4. And in these experiments, Tao demonstrated that if you block RAGE with a selective antagonist called FPS-ZM1, you can block platelet activation in response to LTC4 or LTA4 quite nicely. The TLR4 antagonist LPS-RS has no effect. So this is fairly complicated, so just to break it down into the simplest possible terms, what I've just told you is that there is a potential interaction here whereby granulocytes making LTA4 can activate a platelet through platelet conversion of that LTA4 to LTC4, signaling through cis-LT2, releasing HMGB1, and signaling to rage. The in vitro data support that. But what about the in vivo situation? Is this 
physiologic at all? Is it relevant to the AERD model? So to come back to the model, in these experiments, Tao treated his PGE synthase knockout mice with three different blockers, a blocking antibody against HMGB1 or an isotype control, the rage inhibitor FPS-ZM1 or a vehicle control, or a CIS-LT2 selective antagonist called HAMI-3379, which is not clinically available, or it's vehicle control, and then challenge the mice. And this is the change in airways resistance. And in all three instances, you get essentially the same amount of inhibition. It almost goes down to baseline. And when you look in the BAL fluid for the mediators that you expect to be released during this reaction, the release of HMGB1 is pretty much back to baseline. The release of cystinoleukotrienes is pretty much back to baseline. And the release of CXCL7, which we're using here as a platelet-specific degranulation marker, is also down to baseline. So I think this implies that the mechanism of platelet activation in this model is a pathway of CIS-LT2, HMGB1, and RAGE. So if you block that pathway, what do you do to the mast cell activation? You also markedly attenuate the mast cell activation as indicated by the release of the protease MMCP1, histamine, and prostaglandin D. So now we have a mechanism to account for the platelet activation, and we confirm the platelet activation leads to the mast cell activation, but what's the connecting piece? How does the platelet communicate with the mast cell? Well, it turned out about three years ago that Tao published a paper that implicated the cytokine IL-33 in AERD physiology and in mast cell activation. Uh, this is a Western blot uh, showing IL-33 protein. Now, IL-33 is a very powerful type 2 cytokine, and it's a strong agonist for mast cell activation. And these are four subjects with AERD. These are four aspirin tolerant controls. This is whole nasal polyp lysate. And there's a nice strong band for IL-33 here that's just stronger in the AERD than the aspirin tolerant controls. And these smaller bands are proteolytically processed uh, variants of IL-33. Over here are a set of experiments in, done by Katie Bookheit. This is intact nasal polyp tissue, freshly surgically excised. And she's asking a question whether exogenous leukotrienes can induce IL-33 release from this intact tissue. It's very hard to get IL-33 released from any single cell. Tried it a bajillion different ways, nothing ever worked. But you can get it released from this intact tissue in response to LTC4. Now, the tissue is complex. There's a lot of cell types in there, including platelet adherent granulocytes. This doesn't say where it's coming from. It just says there's a pathway that leukotrienes can use to induce release of IL-33. And does that matter? Well, coming back to the physiologic model in the mouse, in this experiment, Tau shows that if you block IL-33 with a monoclonal antibody, or if you block IL-33 receptor signaling with a decoy recombinant soluble receptor, you can block the change in airways resistance, and you can block the mast cell activation. Ergo, IL-33 is immediately proximal to the mast cell. So there has to be a platelet IL-33 connection in there, and it turns out that there is. A couple of years ago, Takeda and colleagues reported in a very nice Jackie study that platelets store full-length IL-33. And in these experiments, Tao, first of all, confirmed that platelets store IL-33, but more importantly, he shows that if you stimulate the platelets with LTC4, they release IL-33. This is the supernatant of activated platelets up here. This is the pellet from the corresponding samples down here, just to show you that when you maximally activate the platelet with calcium ionophore, you completely deplete the pellet and all of it comes out into the supernatant. And when you do the stimulation with LTC4 and you block RAGE or you block CIS-LT2, there's no release of IL-33. So this is a pathway that platelets use to release IL-33. Now remember, I told you earlier, platelets get recruited during a reaction. So they're being recruited along with their granulocytes, and they're carrying, they must be carrying IL-33 into the lung with them 
And that's exactly what these experiments showed. This is lung IL-33, measured after a 45-minute challenge with PBS or lysine aspirin. The IL-33 with lysine aspirin goes up by about two and a half to three-fold during that short period of time. And that's totally platelet-dependent. And that's totally dependent on the CIS-LT2 HMGB1 rage signaling pathway. And just to lend a little bit more weight to the IL-33's physiologic importance, the other thing that IL-33 does is it activates innate lymphoid cells to make IL-5 and 13. And during that same very brief time frame, you can appreciate a significant increase in lung IL-5 and lung IL-13 that is completely blocked when you deplete the platelets and completely blocked when you block CIS-LT2, HMGB1, and RAGE. So, to summarize a complex story with an equally complex diagram, and I apologize for that, but I don't think there's any other way to do it. The principal event, we think, is that this is an inflammatory disease where you don't have an appropriate induction of the COX-2 system, which renders prostaglandin E production disproportionately dependent on COX-1. That's what makes the system leaky, and that's what uh, makes the system unbraked when you give a COX-1 antagonist. We think the initial, at least in the mouse, the initiating event is the leukotriene production that's unbraked by PGE that goes through the platelet that induces this HMGB1 rage alarm, if you like, that provides IL-33 to activate the mast cell and the ILC2 leading to mediator production and changes in airway physiology. And Hopefully from looking at this, you can see where a number of potential uh, therapeutics might work. And many of these are therapeutics that are uh, not yet available and in the pipeline. And before closing, I do want to talk about uh, one additional piece that may, we think, perhaps turn out to be a therapeutic. And this is a way of blocking the platelet activation pathway, utilizing an antagonist of the thromboxane receptor known as ephetraban. Now, platelets use thromboxane as a major amplification mechanism. And it turns out that when you give Tau's mice a TP receptor antagonist in their drinking water before you do the aspirin challenge, it pretty much blocks the airway resistance, the release of CXCL7 from the platelets, and all the BAL fluid mediators. It's, a very, it's actually the most effective way of blocking a reaction that we found in vivo short of actually depleting the platelets. And since ephetraban actually has a fairly extensive history of utilization in humans, it was never licensed by the FDA. It was actually developed as a cardiovascular drug, but unfortunately got dropped because it's more expensive than aspirin and no more effective than aspirin for cardioprotection. The drug's been floating around out there, and Cumberland Pharmaceuticals some years ago approached us about potentially doing a trial. And so Tanya, along with Elliot Israel's group, is executing a parallel group design proof of principle study in which ephetraban for four weeks is compared with the placebo uh, leading up to an aspirin challenge and desensitization with the goal being to see if we can prove the hypothesis that this initiation of a reaction through the platelet and IL-33 is what drives it and that perhaps uh, this may serve as a therapeutic at some point in the future. And it's really a lot of fun to have hung around long enough now to get to the point where doing bench science and doing mouse work and now actually having colleagues around you who do real human work gives you some advantages and gives you some opportunities that you couldn't have envisioned. And so I want to thank the people that really do the work, uh, particularly uh, Tao and uh, Lily Fang, who do pretty much all this beautiful mouse work, and they've been with me for a while now. Uh, Howard, who did the immunohistology, uh, Tanya, who runs a first-rate clinical program in AERD and a translational program, along with her colleague Katie Bookheit, and uh, up until uh, this August, uh, Katie Cahill then went on to Vanderbilt to start her own program. We have wonderful colleagues here at the Brigham, Elliot, who gives us the infrastructure to conduct the trials, Neil Bhattacharya, who gives us uh, access to the sinus tissue, and of course our collaborators uh, within the section who've been so useful over the years in terms of mentoring and in terms of thinking about integrated biology. And I want to thank also the NIH for funding it, and thank you, Chris, again for the opportunity.
absolutely terrific. Thank you so much. That brilliant science, beautifully elucidated. It's terrific. Can I ask a question while everybody thinks of their question, which is, I, I think you showed us the uh, platelet granulocyte coupling in human nasal tissue and in mouse model airways. Mm -hmm. Have you seen it or evidence in human airways? In human airway, human lower airways. Yes. Um, give us some biopsies, we'd be delighted to look. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the answer is no, but the only limitation is availability of tissue. Um, uh, the only data I'm aware of comes from a very old Peter Jeffrey study uh, with Barry Kay, and they showed extravasated platelets by EM, but I don't think they were paying any attention to whether or not they were platelet adherent granulocytes. Would a bronchial biopsy give you deep enough yep. sampling? It might sure, hurt. as long as there are CD45 positive granulocytes in the biopsy, they should be able to answer the question. Yeah. Right. Here we go. Yeah, uh, the, the question was what happens to platelets and leukotrienes during viral infection. Um, there are certainly a fair bit of evidence that leukotrienes are generated uh, during viral infection, during rhinovirus, and during RSV, particularly RSV, as measured in nasal lavage samples. Uh, what, whether that involves platelets or not, I don't know. I don't think anybody's looked. Hmm. Boy, it's a beautiful question. The question was, how does chromalin work? Do we understand anything more about the mechanism? Um, I have to claim ignorance here. Uh, I don't know that much progress has been made in this area for over 20 years because people stopped using chromalin. I think there was a binding protein putatively identified. I'm not sure that that was ever sorted out what that binding protein was. Frank, do you happen to know? If he doesn't know, I feel better about it. Yeah. yeah. Nobody ever reproduced it. Yeah. So I think you don't need a higher dose of aspirin to de The question is, how about desensitization? The therapeutic effect of high dose aspirin and the desensitization, I think you have to separate a little bit. And Tanya, feel free to jump in here. But the dose that elicits a clinical desensitization is typically the same dose that causes a reaction, right, which is a COX-1 dose. Um, and in fact, one of the predicted outcomes of blocking thromboxane, which is a target in the platelet of COX-1 inhibition, might be that you've effectively desensitized them. Now, what does the high-dose aspirin actually do to improve clinical outcomes? Nobody knows. We know that um, you can significantly reduce prostaglandin D production, for example. Um, is that part of the desensitization mechanism? Uh, we think that it might be, but it's probably not the whole story. Uh, the only person I'm aware of who's ever looked at anything other than aspirin as a potential therapeutic was Don Stevenson. They didn't publish their data, but they say, don't even bother with ibuprofen or with, the, I can't remember what else he used. It doesn't work. Only aspirin works. And when you start giving a 650 BID, you start to do a lot with aspirin that has nothing to do with COX, acetylation of proteins, of DNA, and who knows, yeah. Anything else? Right? Well, thanks for coming, folks. Yeah.